Welcome to Serious Business on NDTV. 30 minutes of hard business news. One topic, one speaker and a conversation that's relevant to you. I'm Manvi Sinhadhilan. Data is fact. Well, that's how a layperson like you and me would approach it. And yet, if you're plugged into the economic debate about India, you'd be hearing different points of view on the economic data, some of it right here on Serious Business. So today, ahead of the interim budget on February 1st, we will focus on some key economic indicators. Not all of them, mind you, we don't have the time. I will lay out the negatives highlighted by some economists, and the counter view will come from Dr. Surjit Bhalla, an economist, a columnist, and former executive director to the IMF. I have to say, Dr. Bhalla, it's absolutely fabulous to see you. Yes. It's been ages. Yes, it's great. <laughs> it's great being back. Thanks. Uh, we have about 20 odd minutes uh, and a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to get straight to it. We have a general election this year, so it makes sense to compare economic growth in the UPA period, the UPA chapter, and in the Modi-led NDA period. So that's 2004 to 2013 is one period, and the other is uh, uh, 2014 mm. to 2023. Now, when I look at the data, India grew 7.8% mm -hmm. in the UPA chapter and grew 6.9% in the NDA okay. chapter. That's a very straightforward growth rate yeah. comparison. You will argue it's not a meaningful comparison. Why? <clears throat> because it depends growth rate of any country nowadays in a globalized world. That's why we call it a globalized world. When you're an island economy just by yourself, that would make complete sense. Now what happens in the rest of the world affects you as well. Now something very, very important happened in the rest of the world to a much greater degree in the 2014 to 23 period than in the 2004 to the 13 period. And that's what we call the COVID era. Now, the co COVID had an impact, and I think many countries followed a mistaken policy <clears throat> of lockdowns, etc., which exaggerated any effect on the economy that would have been in a normal reaction to the crisis. That's my personal viewpoint. Nevertheless, the fact remains the world has not seen as big a decline in any two-year period over the last 70 years. Okay. So obviously, you have to be, take that into account. So you're saying India is integrated with the world economy. The period uh, 2014 to 2023 had an external event. Big time external which event. Which was, it's like, you know, if the I most... can interrupt you, it's like doing a comparison of... 1941 to 45 between countries that were engaged in the World War II and those that were not. Okay. So what, you know, uh, how would you compare the growth rate in these two periods? Yeah. So economists are quite used to doing this, taking out outliers. Okay. Okay. Whether positive or negative. So <clears throat> the easiest thing to do is to ignore 2020 for the uh, uh, COVID period and the next year, 2021, because both of them will be affected, but basically ignore one of them. And the same thing I do for the 2004 to 2013 period, where is the, COVID, the year of the financial crisis. crisis. Now, it so happened that the financial crisis did not have much of an impact in India. It had an impact in the rest of the world. And when I say the rest of the world, it's mostly the Western world. China, etc., weren't We're really not impacted. So when you're doing this, you have to... And the second point I want to make <clears throat> in any comparison is that 2004 to 2013 happened to be the bumper years for the world economy. Sure. We haven't been back there since. So two events, 2004 to 2013, the biggest all-time growth for the world economy, and 2014 to 2023 is with the, the shock, which is the biggest shock ever that the world has received since World War II. Yes. So therefore, it seems very normal to say, okay, 
I'm going to look at India's growth and world growth excluding these years. Simple. And what do you get out of that? And what you get out of that is that <clears throat> India's growth, much to the chagrin of some of the critics of the government, uh, but really that's what an analyst has to do, is take out your own personal biases in any result and try and see what the data is telling you. And what you get out of that is that the excess growth. So then next step, we take out those years, but how do we compare? Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so I compare with excess growth along with my colleague, uh, co-author co Karan Basin. I say that, look, I'm going to look at how much India's growth exceeded the, rest the of world the growth. Okay? And, all, <coughs> and then you find out that basically, much to the surprise of many, including ourselves, that when you do that, it turns out that 2004 to 2013 was not as good a growth period. Both of them are very good, okay? But therefore, but 2014 to 23 was greater excess growth for India. So according to that criteria and that criteria alone, that since you introduced the subject by saying this is an election year, so we are interested in how the two major Though I don't know whether we can call, we can call the Congress anymore a major player uh, politically. But these were the two big uh, players over the last 20 years in the Indian economy. So India scores better in the 2014 to 23 period on the excess growth parameter. Yes. As compared to 2004 to 2013. Yes. And point taken that really you have to try and keep the rest of the world and how it's performed out exactly. of the comparison. Yes, exactly. Okay. The one um, area where there you know, is more consensus is that a really important driver of growth is investment, right? Yes, absolutely. So now if you look the at... The important driver. If you look at investments as a proportion of GDP, India is investing less as a proportion of GDP in the Modi-led NDA chapter than in the UPA chapter, correct? No. I know, I know there's a but coming. Yes. But nominal. Yes. Nominally. And this is an important correction, if okay. I may say so. So when we do the nominal investment ratio to GDP comparison, yeah. the UPA chapter's ahead. Ahead. Now you'll say... Nominal is not the right way to look at it. Let's yes. look at real. Yes. So what is real? Real is just like, um, let's say your income is 100 rupees. Okay? Make it 100,000 or whatever it is, right? And <clears throat> this year. And five years from now, your income goes up to 200,000. And inflation has gone up by 100%. Prices have doubled. Simple. You're it's exactly real. where you were five it's, years ago. It's, it's as Clinton might say, it's the real stupid. So you, <clears throat> you can't do economic comparisons. Remember growth rates. We didn't do growth rates in nominal comparisons. According to that, the UPA period was even better because they had much higher inflation, almost double the rate of inflation during 2004 to 13 than postman. So it's the most obvious thing. And actually that brings up an interesting point that I was rather surprised when I wrote that piece. How come no one had ever mentioned it before in the constant debate and discussion about investment and growth, including former RBI governor Rangarajan, one of India's leading economists, in his book had comparing nominal investment rates. So I, I think there's something else to the story, but really, it's the real investment rate that matters, and that matters for growth. Nominal, who cares? So you're basically saying take the nominal investment rate, adjust it for the inflation in the period, you get the real uh, investment rate, you also then have to have a real GDP calculation, look at the ratio, and it's better in the... Yes. It's better in the Modi NDA... No. A, better yeah. than the nominal picture. Much better. But then... Yeah. What puzzled me, Dr. Bhalla, was the fact that even if we look at real investment, 
it's comparable. It's not far oh, higher. Absolute, absolute, no, no, absolutely. And if you remember, I didn't say that it is higher. I said that, look, the constant debate had been, we've already discussed on the growth as to how that was higher in real terms in the 2004-13 period, but not in excess growth terms. Yes. So that's number one. Number two, the constant refrain has been that, look, we need to raise our investment rates okay, to the levels that we had in the 2004-13 period. Now, one, that basically if you take out the same story actually on the COVID thing, but I didn't do that. I only concentrated on the fact that the investment rate now is around 35% in real terms, whereas it's only about 30% or 31% in nominal terms. So the constant refrain of Rangarajan and other economists was that we need to raise our rate of investment to somewhere around the mid 30s or 33, 34% to, sustain and I, to get the growth rate that we would like, which is 7% plus. And that's what I said, we are there, mate. We are having that investment rate and we are having that growth rate. So therefore, before the data had come out on 7%, but now we are going to grow at 7, 8% for two consecutive or three consecutive years. And that's what is showing up in the investment rate and that's what's showing up in the growth rate. And mind you, there is no COVID shock, etc. So therefore, no need to exclude anything. This is a straightforward translation of investment to growth. And you underline the fact that 23-24 is an important year because it's like a first normal year. Yes, worldwide. Worldwide. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a year that you pay extra attention to yeah. for projecting. Actually, there are two normal years. Look, look, the COVID crisis was 2021. And the next year needs to be excluded because that's a recovery from the COVID years, so 21-22. So 22, 23, 23, 24, we have two normal years and hopefully the normal years will continue for the rest of the world and for ourselves. I'm getting into the weeds here okay. and I'm always wary when I get into the weeds because this is television and we need to bring clarity and yeah. light to our viewers. But the GDP deflator, uh, because that, in a sense, the debate about the GDP deflator raises questions about India's growth rate as well. So let's just take a moment here mm -hmm. to explain what is the role of the deflator. Mm -hmm. I will highlight where the controversy is stemming from. Yeah. But the deflator. Actually, let's come to the punchline first. If you do the deflator correctly, the growth rate will be enhanced. Okay. Having come to the punchline, now let's look. First, you need to look at the deflator, just like I mentioned with your income. When inflation goes up, you need to do everything real. Now, with GDP growth, there is that there are inputs which sell or which are bought at a particular price, and there are outputs which are sold at a particular price. Those two inflation rates are not the same. Okay? Input prices have, if commodity prices go down, etc., you know that from your shows, etc. Profits go up and so on and so forth. So you need to correct. Basically, all, all economists do, okay, all around the world, forever and forever, is to adjust nominal numbers to real numbers. Because real numbers are meaningful, nominal numbers are not meaningful. So you need to adjust for input prices and for output, output prices. Yeah. And that's called the double deflation method. And that's not what we're following. That's not what we are following. So to that extent, there is a gap yes. in the deflator. Yeah. And it so happens, and this is an important point, sorry to interrupt, that we know that input prices have gone up at a much lower rate than output prices. So therefore, that will affect the deflator uh, is lower when you measure as a weighted average of output and input. Well, I think we've try to shine some light mm -hmm. on the debate. We're going to take a break, and there are many other aspects of the economy to cover, not all of which we'll be able to do in this conversation. But the K-shaped recovery, perhaps that's an important one. 
when we return with Dr. Surjeet Palla. Welcome back to Serious Business on NDTV. Today we're in conversation with Dr. Surjeet Palla, economist, columnist, former executive director to the International Monetary Fund, and ahead of the budget and ahead of an election, but I'm hoping that we can meet uh, many more times before the election. We're trying to take stock of the Indian economy, break it into key buckets. So far, we've talked about growth, mm -hmm. and we've talked about investment, and some of the debate around how you should view the numbers. Uh, which brings me to the assertion that the recovery since COVID has been K-shaped. And you say that for the alphabetically challenged, that means that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Uh, how do you rebut that? It's coming, you know, from economists like Koshik Basu, uh, former chief economist of the World Bank. It's very simple, stupid. Um, I read politics into it and nothing more. You preceded your comments by saying there's an election coming up and so on and so forth. That's what's happening. And that basically the opposition, um, because it perceives itself as weak uh, and needs to come up with some kind of a uh, suggestion or assertion that really things are not as good as they appear, has to invent certain stories like a K-shaped recovery. So what is the evidence that you would present to rebut a K-shaped No, recovery? so I would, uh, look, <clears throat> there are several pieces of evidence. First, what is the evidence that is K-shaped? Have you ever, you've been covering economics, etc., for the last 20 odd years or 15 years. Have you ever heard of a K-shaped recovery prior to this? Oh, lots of new things have come along the 20 years. Yeah, yeah. That I, so, you know, so I, I'm always point. open to new stuff. That's that's the point. No, but I'm open Where to new stuff. Where was Koshik Basu talking about a K-shaped recovery when during 2004 to 2013, we had the highest inflation rates ever? And starting 2011, a steady decline in India's growth rate. I didn't hear. Sorry, I, I've got trouble hearing, but I didn't hear any economist on any channel or any, any TV anchor talk about a K-shaped recovery. I discovered K-shaped recovery last year or year before, once the recovery. I didn't discover K-shaped recovery when the COVID crisis hit. At that time, it was, you know, what this very same economist, what they said, oh, look at India. It has gone 6% lower. Never before in India's history has we grown so poorly. So you're contesting that there's no adequate data to support the hypothesis that there is a K-shaped recovery. That's point number one. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying that plus more. I'm saying this is an invention okay. of the opposition politicians slash economists. Okay, point taken. Yeah. Now... If you had to look at reassuring data that yes. rebuts the K-shaped recovery hypothesis, yeah. what would you point us so towards? I would look at, we just talked about growth rate having been excess growth over the rest of the world compared to the 2004-13 period. Okay. Now, if it was a K-shaped recovery and the rich were getting richer, and the large majority of the poor, of the middle class, etc., were not. Why would he get this growth? Remember, we are a population of 1,400 million. The workers are about 450 million. Are you telling me the Keishi recovery are a handful of people that have, or a handful of industries, or a handful of industrialists? So you have to some evidence on the distribution. Now let me give you one piece of evidence. Have these K-shaped, um, K-shaped wallas, for lack of a better term, looked at the tax data, income tax data, as to how fast it has grown? Have they looked at the GST data, which is your consumption data, which is not consumed by a handful of people or a handful of industries, etc. That is telling you it's not K-shaped. Instead, 
what they do, the only piece of evidence that they come up with is look at motorcycles, two-wheelers. I'd look at the unemployment data from Central Oh, we'll come to the unemployment. Oh, I'm happy to look at the unemployment data. You know, I just look at that and say, well, you know, if the unemployment numbers have gone up, yeah. um, the poor are getting left behind. I'm not an economist. I'm yeah, just putting I, it out there. Maybe some other time. But let's look at the unemployment data. It turns out that the unemployment data, the latest 20 to 23, which is, remember, we can't take 2021. We can't take 21, 20, but take it, take it. No, Be we won't take guest. it. We won't take it. Be my guest. No, no, Actually, we won't take it. On the unemployment data, I want to come back to, you know, in 20, when the first time the PLFS data was released in 2018-19. And the government had not released that data in time. And so you had the resignations of Mr. Mohanan, the chief, uh, uh, chief, uh, uh, <coughs> chief statistician of India. They resigned because the data were not released in time. Now, what did, that what did that data show? That unemployment rate in India was something like 6.2%. Very high, the highest we had observed since the 1980s. Okay? And in there, they said that, look, this is very bad for the government. That's why they didn't release it in time. I think they should have released it in time. Because of one special reason, and we had done a paper, Tita Das and I, for the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council in some time in late 2018, where we looked at not just the unemployment rate in 2011-12, when it was something close to 2%, 2.5%, but all the way till 14-15. That data was done by the Labor Bureau, and that showed for two consecutive years, unemployment rate was 5%. Okay. So, you know, the economy the, inherited by the Modi government was not in terribly good shape, which, as you know, why, I mean, a lot of words have been written as to why the government... But, you know, the periodic labor force survey, Yeah. we've been talking on the basis of that. Yeah. And then you have the Center for Monitoring the Indian Economy. And I don't think we have time to get into whether or not that data is inadequate, but you know, it is widely referred yeah, but, to. Okay, let's, and that's showing very high unemployment rates. Yeah, let's do, I'm, you know, I, I think I mentioned that this is political. Let's get to the CMI data. CMI data, the very same that you are citing, shows that the labor force participation rate of women is lower than any other country in the world. Is lower than Yemen. Yes. Is lower than Syria. So I think we have to be a little bit responsible. Just like somebody comes up with a survey, doesn't mean that survey is accurate. And I think it's irresponsible for anchors and TV guys and journalists do not, when it, if it was, they are saying 10% and the PLFS is saying 12%, 13%, that's not, that's, that's what I'm, it's not worth worrying about. That's fine, two or three. They are saying 10% and you know what the latest 20 to 23 survey shows? Close to 40%. You know, a casual observer knows that women are increasing in the labor force. Now, how can you cite a data which shows 10% lower than Yemen? I mean, you know, even the producers of the data have to be a little bit more responsible. Well, so I won't comment on the user. Now let's get to what the PLFS, the non-garbage data shows. PLFS, and PLFS also has problems, okay? There's no data that's perfect. So I'm not giving PLFS as perfect and this one as completely imperfect, is CMI. I'm saying all data has problems around the world. And ILO and all statisticians and economists and the World Bank have looked at these data, etc. 
<coughs> that data shows a large increase in female labor force participation. So it's now close to 40. And there are two different definitions of um, labor force uh, participation. One is the usual status. Well, let's not basically, get into that. Yeah, yeah. It's a vast gap. It's the Grand Canyon. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave it at that. There's a lot of unexplored territory, and I hope we're going to meet more well, frequently well explored now. Well, by economists, but I'll be happy to explore it further with you on your show. But this is conventional wisdom. Okay. And, um, yeah, like I said, I mean, look forward to exploring many more of these <laughs> recurring themes, uh, especially in the months ahead mm. of the general election. Dr. Bala, always great to have a conversation with you. Thank you very much.